Well, yeah, please uh, come to that. All right, well, we are taking a pause this morning from our series in the book of Daniel uh, while Pastor Dan is away. There's a few weeks spread throughout the summer where Pastor Dan will be gone and he's asked me to preach in his stead. And so um, as I fill in, you know, with a few sermons spread throughout the summer, I thought it would uh, be appropriate to maybe do a, a mini side series that is separate from Daniel. And so after giving some prayer and discussion to it, I landed on Paul's letter to the Colossians. It's a relatively short letter, only four chapters, and even so, I still won't be able to cover every verse in the letter with just um, about four sermons that I'll be able to go through it on. But one of the things that I was reflecting on as I considered Colossians is the fact that even though the book of Daniel and the letter of the Colossians are very different types of literature, uh, they, they come in totally different styles, they're under, written under very different circumstances. One's from the Old Testament, one's from the New Testament, and yet they actually pair quite nicely together. The, the situation in the first century church at Colossae under Roman rule, it in a way correlates to the situation of Daniel and his friends in exile in Babylon, which I believe also correlates to our situation in 21st century America. Pastor Dan kind of brought out this point as he introduced the series on Daniel. He talked about how, you know, the kingdom of Judah went into exile. They were taken away from their homeland. They were taken into this foreign land um, because of their disobedience, but they were taken into exile. They lived under a foreign culture with a foreign language, um, a foreign way of life, customs, even a different religion that was in power. They were exiles. And, and so they had to navigate how do they, as faithful worshipers of Yahweh, live in a foreign land. And the book of Daniel, it shows that a faithful Yahweh worshiper didn't have to fully rebel against everything in this pagan culture. They could wear their clothes, they could speak their language, they could take their names, and serve in their government even. But at times they had to stand up and refuse to compromise when it came to in conflict with faithfulness to Yahweh. And think about how similar that is to the situation of followers of Jesus in the first century AD, living under Roman rule. Again, even if it, they grew up under Roman rule, even if they grew up with Roman customs, they now belong to a different kingdom, to a different way of life, to a different value system. And that's similar also, I believe, to today in 21st century America living under secular rule. We need wisdom to know how to navigate engaging in our culture and yet not compromising with the culture that we live in. But before we get into what Paul has to say to the Christians in this circumstance, allow me to provide a little more background to this letter to the Colossians. And so we'll just watch just a brief introduction from the Bible Project to get some background. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter is addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he didn't start. This church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. And Epaphras had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall, but he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. You can watch the rest of that video um, at BibleProject.com or on YouTube. But for now, I think that just gives us the, the brief background behind this uh, letter to a people that 
Paul had never met, as it says. Epaphras was the guy who introduced the gospel to this city, um, a relatively small city compared to um, a city that was a bit larger, Ephesus, that was on the coast. It would almost be like uh, the city of Seattle compared to Yakima, something like that. And there was about that level of distance between the two. And the Colossian church, they lived in a culture that promoted all kinds of syncretistic religious ideas. That was that they lived in a culture where lots of different ideas were swirling around in the culture and in the atmosphere. And it was kind of a, you pick and choose and you just blend them all together and kind of form your own way of life. It even included elements of Judaism. It included elements of Greco-Roman paganism and, and different mystery religions. And the church, it faced pressure to allow other worldviews and spiritual ideas to accompany or reframe the message about Jesus. And Paul set out in this letter to address these diverse competing ideologies. And his main way of doing that wasn't to dissect each and every one of them, to outline them all and then to show their flaws. I mean, at times he, he showed their flaws, certainly. But his main uh, way of doing this was to focus on the gospel, to focus on what is true and then why is it that these other ideas fall short of what's true, what's most powerful? He reinforced the message of Christ and its power to change the life of the believer. And how we also face many ideas and philosophies and value systems in our culture, they're all competing for our attention. They all wish to influence us, to claim our allegiance, and many of them aren't too picky about, you know, if you want to add Jesus into that, if you, want to, as a, if you want to pay lip service to Jesus, but they are only a, really um, tolerant of a syncretistic Jesus, one who can at least be in submission to the value systems of the day. Well, Paul's solution uh, is to remind the Colossian believers about who Jesus really is and then show them how that Jesus is the only one who can bring the real solutions that we need for life's problems. No other second-rate Jesus will do. He acknowledges the existence of these other philosophies, but then he puts them in that bigger framework of how they are inferior to Jesus. He spells out for them the real power for change and for true fulfillment, which is Christ in them. And so I've subtitled this series, Filled Full in Christ, because fulfillment is a key word um, throughout the letter of Colossians. And that was something that these kind of false ideas were promising to the Colossian believers, that they could find fulfillment, they could find fullness in these other ways of life. But, Jesus, but Paul says that that true fulfillment only comes through Jesus. And then he gives some very practical ways of living out that life in chapters 3 and 4. But for today, I want to look at how Paul begins his letter to this community that he has not personally met. And Paul begins with a prayer. He gives them and us a peek into his prayer closet so that these believers can know what is it that Paul prays for when he prays for them. And while he elaborates on his prayer for the Colossians, he simultaneously paints a picture of how the gospel changes lives and continues to change the life of a Christian. The picture he paints with his words is one of spiritual growth and producing fruit. Or as I would like to call it today, he paints a picture of the gospel garden. How we are like plants that produce fruit. He uses this language of bearing fruit and growth. And in the beginning, of this encouraging letter to the church in Colossae, Paul begins with a prayer-oriented portrait of what he's calling them to do and to believe. So let's read it together and then we'll look at it more closely in Colossians chapter 1 and we'll just be covering the first 14 verses. Here he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope 
stored up for you in heaven, and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So here it's very easily broken up into just two paragraphs. You can, most of your uh, translations will, will have different paragraph um, ways that they divide up the letter. And you can see there's just two simple paragraphs. The first paragraph is a prayer of thanksgiving. And then the second paragraph is a request to God to do something for them. Or in other words, the first part, Paul gives thanks to God for their spiritual life that they are spiritually alive because of the message of the gospel, and then he prays for their spiritual growth. These are images that are reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. Anytime you come across kind of fruit language or garden language or plant language, it's usually a a throwback to the Garden of Eden, to the, the first chapters of the Bible. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a little bit. But it also is reminiscent of Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed, one that you're probably familiar with, where Jesus says that there is a, a sower who went out and scattered seed on the ground, which fell on four different kinds of soil, representing four different heart conditions. And only the good soil produced a harvest. So here, in the way Paul is talking about the Colossians, um, he, there's also this emphasis and similar elements to the metaphor. And yet there's also some differences. But we have, at the very least, the same seed that is sown. The seed being the gospel, the good news of God's kingdom. This is the the seed that, um, maybe he doesn't explicitly call it a seed, and yet he's saying, this is, you heard the gospel and it produced fruit. It caused growth and it's growing throughout the whole world. And then he prays for them to have more fruit. And this is the gospel of God's grace. We could call it the gospel of God's kingdom because it is a message about a kingdom that we are invited into. But the only way that we have access to that kingdom is by the grace of God. And that is what he says in that first paragraph where he says how they have truly understood God's grace in verse 6. But then he also talks about the fruit that comes from this seed. And the first being faith in Jesus, and then love for God's people, and thirdly, hope of heavenly inheritance. So in verses 4 and 5, he says, Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard. Faith, hope, and love, which are a famous triad of the Apostle Paul. He loves to pair these three things together. It's kind of his way of summarizing the whole Christian life. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where maybe it's most well-known, where he says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. He also pairs them together, or or, I don't know, is there a pair only referencing two things? So how how would you say he puts this triplet together? Um, In 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, 
He says, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. One Bible commentator puts it like this. When Paul combines these three elements of Christian spirituality, as in this context, it is usually to provide a basic and sufficient description of the genuine Christian. These three qualities are the hallmarks and proper evidences of a work of God in the soul of man. More than this may not be required in assessing the worth of a believer's claim to be a true child of God. This is the fruit that you should naturally see in the life of someone who has submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. Someone who has put their faith and trust in him and his completed work. That's that work of the Spirit in our heart then produces this kind of fruit. Faith in Jesus. Now, faith, it may also be spoken of as kind of the access point to that salvation. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. But here it's also spoken of as the fruit of the Spirit's work in a person's life. God's grace having its effect on a person results in trusting in Jesus, trusting in his teaching, in his work on the cross, in his lordship, trusting that Jesus is the one who leads us into relationship with the Father, with our creator, and access into new creation, into his kingdom. But also love for God's people is a fruit of this gospel message. That is that strangers can become instant family. You know, when I visit another church or when I I meet another person that has put their faith in Christ, there's often an, an instant connection, a sense of family. It doesn't matter what ethnicity or nationality, the spirit of Christ unites us. I remember even as a teenager going down to, to Portland with my brother for a Christian conference, and we stayed with a couple that went to a church, um, the church that was hosting the conference. And even though we were total strangers, we had just met, they instantly felt like family. They instantly felt like my parents. And I could give a dozen other examples of that happening, even when I first came to this church in 2020, that there was an instant sense of family here because of what we shared in Christ. When you accept Christ, it's, it's never just about you and him. It's never just this personal relationship that you can do in a closet and, and that's all it is. Faith in Christ is always accompanied with the love of God's people. And it's a humbling and, and important thing to realize that this is, is way bigger than ourselves. It's bigger than even just our sliver of the church that is constrained by time and geography to this building. You know, Paul says the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. And much more so is it the case today where it has reached even further, this message. And we belong to this worldwide family in Christ and it's important to remember that. Uh, And I was especially reminded of that when I taught through um, a series on church history and how, it, like I said, it's not just geography but it's also time that it spans across. Um, It's such a marvelous cosmic thing that is is so beyond us that it's hard to even wrap our minds around. And a third fruit is that that hope of heavenly inheritance. I put it as heavenly inheritance um, because we can often have misconceptions about what he's talking about here. He says, you know, you have the, the hope of heaven. And so we often think about, oh, he's talking about when you die. And I, I think that is a, a small piece of it. But actually, I think what he's mostly getting to is the hope of God's realm, which we call heaven. You know, this thing is beyond us, beyond the physical realm, which holds, uh, it's, it's kind of the storehouse of our heavenly treasure and of our inheritance. So the fullness of the kingdom of God exists in God's realm, which will one day, it says, will be reunited with the physical realm. And so the, there will be a new heaven and a new earth in which we will live in forever in his kingdom. And so we have this hope of heaven, which is where the storehouse of our inheritance. This inheritance that we didn't earn, it's not something that um, we can even do, you know, just by our own efforts, provide our own access to it. It's God's gracious gift, his free gift 
to us. And it produces hope, a, a kind of constant expectancy that this is coming. Not just a, oh, I, I hope it happens, but maybe it won't, but something that we're anticipating daily and knowing that it is coming. And Paul, he then tells, you know, he gives thanks for these things, for this kind of fruit that he sees in, in the lives of believers. But Paul has, while he's reminded them of what they already have, now he goes on in the second paragraph, the second part of this introduction, this prayer, and he prays that they would be filled even more. That there is so much um, that we have received at the moment of salvation. It might be easy to think, okay, it's all done. We've, we've received everything we need. But it won't take long to feel like, actually, hang on a second. I need a little more direction here. How do I live this thing out? What does it mean for when I come into a problem at work or when I'm facing an issue in my family, when I encounter all kinds of trials? What does it look like then to live this out? And so that is what he prays for. And just looking at it once again, verses 9 and 10, he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And so, kind of carrying on this uh, metaphor of a garden, you know, when a a plant, you know, the seed sprouts and it produces um, the plant and then maybe even starts to produce fruit, that's not the end of the story, right? I know that my wife recently planted a garden uh, just in a little wagon, and we started producing some strawberries there. We've probably had like four strawberries so far in the year. And it's awesome to see some fruit, um, one of my favorite, probably my favorite food group. And so it, it's not just that, okay, well, that's all you have to do. Just it'll start producing fruit, and now it's, it's done. Sometimes the plant gets sick. Sometimes um, it has too much sun on it. Sometimes it needs a little more water or a little less water. There's nutrients that is needed for that continual growth. And so here, what Paul prays for, for their continual growth, is the knowledge of God's will. Which then he adds in there uh, another triad of words, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. These three words that all go together in scripture, often, especially in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, these things are paired together often, where there's something about uh, knowing the right things to do, but then Knowing the why behind it is kind of that understanding piece of it. Why is it that we're doing this? What's the the principle that's undergirding this instruction? And then we need wisdom, which is kind of that practical application of it, of how do I actually live this out and develop the skill set to apply this knowledge? And so we need this knowledge of God's will that is um, in all of the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit of God supplies. We're told that uh, Paul asked God to fill them with this. And I want to unpack it a bit for us. Um, So stick with me as I first just take us back to the beginning of the book of Genesis. Remember um, the Garden of Eden, where God created humanity in his image. He made them to reflect him, uh, to represent him in some unique way in his creation. He's given humans a special place here. Um, to rule over creation on his behalf, or maybe you could also just say in partnership with God, we're to rule in creation. And then in the first story that we get about humanity, we're told that God planted a garden. He made all kinds of trees grow. He made all kinds of fruit grow so that that would be their food for the humans. He put humanity in the garden to work it and to keep it. And as you know, probably one of the Uh, The one tree that they were commanded not to eat from is called the tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of good and bad. And the name of that tree is key to understanding the story. The humans, they needed this kind of knowledge to fulfill their calling, to rule in creation. So what was wrong with them taking the tree of knowledge that they needed? If they took it, then they were going to do so on their terms, in rebellion against God, 
And instead, what I believe is implicit in the story is that they needed to trust in God's instruction, to trust in what he declares to be good and bad and to live in accordance with that. That is what would lead to life and success, is not something, not taking that, that knowledge for themselves and determining it on their own terms, but instead to look to God to supply the knowledge of good and bad. And this is what the Apostle Paul prays for the Colossians, that they would be filled with the knowledge of what God declares to be good and bad, that they wouldn't depend on human wisdom, but instead that they would submit themselves to God and to what he has revealed. James, in his letter to Christians in in chapter 1, verse 5, says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So this, the knowledge and wisdom that Paul asked God to fill believers with, it's not something that's totally new. It's not something that they don't already possess some level of. You know, in, in that first part where he's thanking God for what they have, he says that they truly understood. They understood God's grace and they learned it. So they had a level of knowledge. But now he prays that they would be filled with it so that they can better discern the will of God for their lives. One Bible scholar puts it like this, it is in order to understand how the will of God translates into the everyday business of living in a complex world that that the Christian needs all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Often, he goes on to say, often they're found together in the Old Testament. These two words are used to describe the qualities that David asked for his son Solomon as he took charge over Israel and that Solomon himself asked for in the light of his vast responsibilities. Faced daily with difficult problems and often even more difficult people, Solomon must know how to relate the unchanging principles of God's will revealed in the law, revealed in the Torah, to the present and quickly changing questions of the day. For such work, the best wisdom of the world is insufficient. So that's the kind of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that I want, that we need. The knowledge of God's will, or we might say the knowledge of God's desires. What is it that he wants done? What is his plan? Or what, is, what are his ways? You know, Jeremiah prophesied that God would one day put his law in their minds, write it on their hearts. And I think that's maybe what Paul has in the background in in his mind of praying for the knowledge, the fullness of of God's will, of knowledge of his will, is knowing that, hey, God promised this. He prophesied that this is what would happen, that we would have it written on our hearts. Moses, in in the book of Exodus, prayed to God, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. David prayed in Psalm 143, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. When we are filled with the knowledge of God's will, which happens through the spirit of God at work in us, then we are equipped to apply scripture to our everyday circumstances. We know how and when to be compassionate, how and when to take a stand. What is a false idea that we need to reject? What is common ground that we need to share with non-believers. This is the prayer of spiritual nutrients so that we can grow and produce that kind of fruit. And as I reflect on that, I also feel the need to put forward a caution. You know, this work of the Spirit to fill us with God's will is, is not something that's separated from Scripture. I mean, I think that's clear, but it's something that leads us to, um, It's not something that leads us to a totally new interpretation of scripture that happens to fit the fads of our day. And I've listened to some messages of of certain, even pastors, of certain churches, and I'm not looking to call out any single church here, but uh, there are churches out there that will use the language of the Spirit is leading us to this new interpretation, to this new understanding of God's will. And it's cloaked in spiritual language, but Yet, that's, uh, when it's in contradiction to the, what's clearly taught in Scripture, we can be confident that that's not the leading of the Spirit. 
The biggest danger I think that Christians face in, in being led astray by false teaching is, is not from the obvious heresies of our day, not from you know, some you know, side cult or something like that. It's error from within the church that's cloaked in Christian language. Its foundation is the ideas and philosophies of our day, but adapting them to Christian vocabulary. And this was the case in Colossae in the first century, and it has continued to be a challenge of the church throughout all generations. So the solution is to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, which the Spirit supplies, which is in agreement with Scripture, but which helps us to apply the timeless truths of Scripture to our time and to our situation. And Paul says that when I am filled with this kind of knowledge, then here's what happens. Here's what it looks like to be filled with the knowledge of God. And this is what he continues in his prayer. Uh, here in verse 10, so that. So that kind of that key, those, those two words are this key link to, okay, I'm praying that you would have this knowledge, this wisdom, this understanding, but here's why I want you to have this knowledge and wisdom and understanding. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and to please him in every way. So the result is a life that's worthy, that's pleasing to God. Something that anyone who loves God, who has their faith in Christ, wants that to be true of them. And he goes on to describe exactly what he means by that, what that looks like. He says, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of, of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father. So let's break down these things that of um, yeah that that the result is that I will live a life worthy of the Lord pleasing to him these four descriptions that we would be wise to take note of in this portrait of the Christian life not as something that we have to conjure up in ourselves but as God brings it forth that he brings about more and more in the Christian life they can be used, these descriptions, these four that we'll look at, as kind of a heart check, as a test to see, is, is this true about me? And if it's not, why not? You know, is it something that I want to be true of myself? You know, fruit takes time, and it doesn't mean that we'll always just instantly have this happen in our lives, but this is why Paul prays it over the Colossian believers. And so the first result, or what it looks like to have a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him, we do that as I bear more fruit in good work. There is good work for us to do, but we don't do it to, to earn God's favor. It's a fruit of being, it's the fruit that naturally happens as we're spiritually alive. It's the fruit of receiving heavenly wisdom and knowledge of God's will. It's, um, you know, if a fruit tree or a vine is not producing fruit, there's something wrong. It might still be alive but it's probably sick or probably hurting. But a healthy tree will produce this kind of fruit. And the focus isn't on doing the good works. It, the focus is on knowing God better, knowing his heart, being in closer relationship with him, and that will produce the good works that we need in our lives. We'll start to care about the things that he cares about. We'll start to reorder our lives in alignment with his values. What he says is important the Lord is certainly worthy of our obedience. He's worthy of having a people carrying out his will in good works. And just as some examples, what, what are these good works that he's talking about? It's the work of raising our kids with patience and compassion. The work of volunteering our time to help others in need. The work of teaching our little ones the ways of God in our children's ministry. The work of generous giving to kingdom purposes. The work of doing a your job, your everyday job with integrity and diligence, not to please your boss, not to please even your customer, but to please God and not man. The work of guarding our lips and using our speech to lift up and to encourage and not to tear down. These are the good works that, that God is worthy of. And our second trait here the, of the result of what it looks like to live a life worthy and pleasing to God is to grow in intimacy with God. This is more than, you know, he, as Paul puts it, to grow in the knowledge of God. But it's more than just knowing things about God, right? 
It's this relational knowledge. It's intimacy. As we're filled with the knowledge of God's will, we, we grow in the knowledge of God. We have good work to do. There's certainly things to be done, but we are also created for relationship, to enjoy God, our creator. One of the results of a person spiritually growing is that they grow in intimacy with God. There will be dry seasons, but even there, a person's roots, again, playing off this uh, plant metaphor, the roots go down even deeper in the dry seasons, and we find a, a new level of refreshment that didn't seem possible before. Thirdly, is as I am strengthened by God, we live a life worthy and pleasing to him. And I think it's, it's so important to constantly be reminded of that as we're going about doing these good works and, and being busy about God's work, we need to continue to rely on his strength, not on our ability to make ourselves more disciplined or more righteous. It is God's power that he works in us. This power, you know, it can be the, the awesome power of, of a miracle, of a healing. The, you know, it's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. And so we should expect and, and anticipate this strength and power of God to perform miracles. But it's also, as it's described here, the power to endure, the power to be patient. I'm reminded of Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 12, where he pleaded with the Lord to take away the, that thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan is what he calls it. And he said, Lord, take this away from me. And three times the Lord came back to him with the words, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. I know there's a lot of debate around what is that thorn. And, you know, I, I don't think it's super important to identify, but I'll give my two cents. I don't think it was a, a physical illness. What he goes on to describe uh, in that passage is, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ, Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. I think that's the kind of thing that he has in mind, that there's all kinds of difficulties, insults. There are people that are opposing him. And he wants their, you know, those who are trying to sow this, this false gospel or who are trying to contradict him, and that's kind of, his thorn in the side, I believe. But either way, it's that God's grace is sufficient for him to endure the difficulty that he's facing. And he's saying that he's even thrilled when he encounters problems that are beyond his control. I mean, do you ever feel like that kind of joy, you know, that when it's like, oh, great, this is something I have no control over and that is totally ruining my life. Great, awesome. God, now you have an opportunity to do something about it. That's, that's tough to face. And yet that is the kind of thing that he describes in here when he's talking about this strength that God provides. You know, he's saying, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. You know, in Philippians 4.13, where Paul you know, famously says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And this is a reference to Paul going hungry, lacking resources. He says, I can do it all because of Christ who gives me strength. In 1 Peter, in his letter to the churches, he talks about serving with God's strength. He says, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God supplies, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. And so God gets the glory. He, it's a life that's worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him when it's not from our own effort, when it's something that he has strengthened us to do. And number four, a life that's worthy of the Lord and pleasing to him is as I express joyful gratitude to God. This joyful gratitude, gratitude for what? And he goes on to, to spell it out for them, but it's, it's for this divine rescue from the dominion of darkness and bringing us into the kingdom of the Son. Or another way of putting it is gratitude for release from our failures, release from our sins, the, all of our moral and other failures, and the bondage that we've, been, we've put ourselves in. When we realize that just by grace, God is, has plucked us out of that bondage, plucked us out of the domi dominion of darkness, 
and put us into the light. Put us into, not because we're good enough, not because of anything we did, but because of his grace. It results in a life of gratitude. And this is something that, you know, the, the false ideas of our age and of the age of the Colossians, you know, they had all kinds of rules. And as, as you, if you continue to read through the, the letter of Colossians, they've got all kinds of rules for them. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. You've got to put your body into strict submission in the ways that they, they think um, and that, that they say are right. And Paul's saying, that, you know, those outward rules, they're, they're not the power that you need um, for change. Instead, you know, you've, you've been rescued out of that by grace, and then it's a life of continued grace, of life in Christ. And that results in gratitude, not a paycheck, but a gift that has been given to us. And this is what it looks like to live a life worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him. This is what it looks like to be spiritually fruitful. It's not exactly the list that maybe I would have come up with, but it's what Paul what comes to Paul's mind as he prays for these believers. Notice how God-centered they all are. It's not about trying harder or keeping all the rules, being more productive so that they have something to offer God. No, it's simply being worthy and it's a pleasing life that is abiding in him, knowing him better, allowing him to strengthen you to do what needs to be done and then being thankful to God for what he has accomplished. And I think it's instructive also that we take to heart that Paul begins his letter with prayer. Before getting into any commands, any warnings about the false teaching that's to come or that he's, he wants to warn them about, he begins with prayer. And prayer that's infused with theology, prayer that's infused with the truths about God. And how often, you know, we neglect prayer. We think a situation is hopeless. We wonder why we seem to aimlessly wander through life. We wonder where God is in my trial. We wonder why we feel empty, which leads us to look elsewhere for fulfillment. We're overwhelmed by the new challenges of our day the new philosophies that seem to threaten our beliefs and our way of life. And I believe that those, are, those threats are real, but we, do we stop to pray and ask for wisdom, to ask God to fill us with the knowledge of his will? Do we seek to submit ourselves to God and to trust that he is working something out? Do I seek to use this trial as an opportunity to walk closer with God, to grow in my intimacy with him? I'm convinced that without this mysterious practice known as prayer, we're left trying to do things on our own strength. And it's something that um, Eugene Peterson in in one of his books that we're reading with uh, the pastor's book discussion that he brings out in this book, Where Your Treasure Is. And he says this about prayer. He says, prayer is political action. Prayer is social energy. Prayer is public good. Far more of our nation's life is shaped by prayer than is formed by legislation. That we have not collapsed into anarchy is due more to prayer than to the police. Prayer is a sustained and intricate act of patriotism in the largest sense of that word. Far more precise, or, yeah, precise and loving and preserving than any patriotism served up in slogans. That society continues to be livable and that hope continues to be resurgent are attributable to prayer far more than to business prosperity or a flourishing of the arts. The single most important action contributing to whatever health and strength there is in our land is prayer. Not the only thing, of course, for God uses all things to affect his sovereign will, and the all things most certainly includes police and artists, senators and professors, therapists and steel workers. But prayer is, all the same, the source of action. We must prioritize prayer. Just one other quote from from Peterson here. He goes on to say, the people who meet in worship and offer themselves in acts of prayer are doing what needs to be done. They welcome others to join them. Their acts of prayer are not restricted to what they do on their knees or at worship. Even as the prayers move into society, they move us into society. There is no accounting for exactly where we end up. Some are highly visible in political movements, while others work obscurely and unnoticed in unlikely places. We learn to be obedient to what the Spirit is 
doing in us and not to envy or criticize what those whose obedience carries them down different paths. This is the work of prayer. When we begin with prayer, it takes us where we need to go. And even as Paul begins this letter of Colossians with prayer, he also ends with a reminder of his co-worker, Epaphras, who was the one who preached the gospel to them and of Epaphras' prayer for them. He says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. I love that image. Wrestling in prayer that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Epaphras' hard work included missionary journeys, it included teaching, it included training leaders, but it most certainly also included the work of prayer. There are many practical commands um, that we could take away from Paul's letter to the Colossians, but for this first message on Colossians, the, the takeaway is begin with prayer. I'm challenged to stop and simply ask God to fill us with the knowledge of his will in our world today, to ask him for the heavenly wisdom that I need to navigate life's complexities. I know I need theology, I need warnings about deceptions that are out there, I need practical, actionable steps to live faithfully, but it all begins with prayer. Prayers of thanks for what he's already done and prayers to be filled where we're lacking. Let's pray. Father, we just confess our need, our need to be filled with the knowledge of your will, with all the wisdom and understanding that your spirit supplies. Lord, we want to live lives that are worthy of you, that are pleasing to you. It's amazing that that's even a possibility. And we know it comes by the work of your spirit in our lives. So we invite you to do that work. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand with me as I read from Hebrews chapter 13 where it says, Now may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.